Welcome to lecture 14. Today we'll be covering launch vehicle standards. Very important because that drives the design. Uh, it drives how uh, requirements are met. And so we're going to be talking about some of those requirements which drive the thickness uh, and a lot of the features that you may have need to be implemented to be able to save weight yet meet uh, requirements that may be outlined by NASA or AIAA or the ISO or European standards, depending upon what organization you're working for. Um, I, I wanna remind everybody, a basis is used for primary structures. Primary structures typically do, do not have load redundancy. And so those structures tend to be the ones that carry the primary loads of the, uh, uh, they basically carry the primary loads. And you can see here that the, the, the fairing the tanks, uh, all these should be considered primary structures because they're carrying the main vehicle loads. A secondary structure, uh, B basis could be allowed. Fatigue and fracture. So for NASA spaceflight structures, um, they're, they're, they're made of well-characterized materials and with sufficient load cycle data that accounts for all service environments. Um, a minimum service life factor of four is usually applied to the service life for fatigue and creep assessments. Uh, usually up to 10 could be used, a factor of 10. So in other words, if I can show um, 1,000 cycles of a particular system or 10,000 cycles of a particular system, we're talking about applying a factor, another factor, a fatigue scatter factor of four to that 10,000, say. Uh, and so that'll give you uh, basically uh, that, that'll give you basically a factor of 2,500. That'll give you a, a life of 2,500 cycles. Buckley needs to be considered as well. Uh, all structure items uh, are subjected to significant amount of in-plane stresses. We talked about that because as the launch vehicle is ascending, you get a huge amount, of, quite a bit of compression on the vehicle and we showed how that happens and it happens because of the angle of attack as an example. Uh, under a combination of ground loads, flight loads or thermal loads, you could have buckling failure. The design loads for buckling have to consider buckling loads, uh, ultimate loads. If a load condition tends to alleviate or helps you with buckling, for example, if pressure helps you with buckling capability because we know pressure does, then the ultimate load is not applied to the pressure, only to those that hurt you. Um, buckling evaluation usually addresses the general instability, crippling and creep. And I have a set of lecture notes on buckling that I cover in the next, uh, in the second portion of this course. Analysis of thin wall structures are subject to buckling load conditions during the service life and accounts for the differences between the idealized model geometry and the physical structure, including boundary conditions. Creep can also be of great importance to, to, to really evaluate. Uh, the specs and standards that drive launch vehicle design, these are not necessarily are the ones that are used in a particular program. These are just examples. So some of this could be even outdated, but the point here is that specification standards for launch vehicles need to be followed when you're designing them. Uh, here you have 1540E that provides verification requirements for launch, upper stage, and space vehicles. The AIAA standards, there's many of them, but also NASA standards. And I'll be going through one of the NASA standards today really quickly so you can see what is in there. But for example, uh, structural systems usually are driven by three AIAA standards. Um, as an example, again, NASA has their own. Every organization will have their own. ISO has their own, uh, international organizations have their own, European standards have their own. And so here you have the S110, which drives the structural uh, requirements, uh, design verification requirements and acceptance requirements and analysis requirements uh, for major structural systems in a launch vehicle. SO80A is intended for metallic pressure vessels, pressurized structures and pressurized components. SO81B provides requirements com for composite overwrap pressure vessels. And then you have 1522A, which is a standard general requirements for safe design and operation. 
Um, and then you have the NASA STD standard 5012, which is requirements for engines, liquid rocket engines specifically. Then you have NASA 5001B, which provides structural design and test factors of safety for spaceflight hardware. So here you have um, an example from the structural requirements in S110. And here, what I wanna provide is what are the test factors and design factors are typically used in the design process. And here for the fleet, if you have a large fleet of launch vehicles or spacecraft, you will use the first uh, row. Here, you apply a, a factor of 1.1 for yield, factor of safety 1.1 to protect against yield failures. Uh, ultimate, and NASA could use even 1.0, you will see in their standards. Uh, but you want to make sure there's no detrimental deformation because of that or, or detrimental issues due to that. And so then 1.25 is the ultimate factor of safety that is used. You can see it's fairly small, but hopefully uh, we have the A base is allowable and we have the uh, 9990 loads, which combined will give you a good, good padding for any uncertainties. Uh, so these are your test factors. The design factors are the one go, that go into the analysis. The test factors are the one that goes into the test. So say I predict 10,000 10, pounds uh, maximum load, limit load uh, due to flight conditions, a critical flight conditions. The 10,000 pounds needs to be multiplied by 1.25 to account for uh, that test factor, the ultimate factor. You wanna make sure that when you go to the ultimate failure or ultimate load conditions that you can strain gauge the test samples sufficiently, that the test article sufficiently to, to validate your analysis because you also have to show good to the analysis design factors. And so these columns here represent your margin of safety calculations basically. The factors are going to your margin of safety calculation. These two columns here that I'm pointing. Um, and so uh, here you can see the test success criteria. You don't, have, you don't want any failure at ultimate load level. And you also don't wanna have any detrimental deformation or damage at 1.1 times limit load, because if you had it, then you clearly validated the yield criterion and something's going on with the yield that's not acceptable. Uh, so this is again, then you have the protocol test single flight article. So meaning this is a small fleet. And a small fleet in this case means that I'll take a single test article. It's not a dedicated test article. So that unit you will also fly is a point. And that's why it's called protocol. And so you test it to 1.1, ultimate to 1.25, but now your design factors are higher. And your analysis is to 1.4 and the yield is 1.25. And this is done to protect against any damage that may have been caused by the test factor. Here for more, you know, you have to be more stringent here. You have to make sure that your analysis really correlates well with tests. You have to make sure that your failure modes are quick validated at least against sub-element testing. Why? Because the, the, the spacecraft or launch vehicle that you're testing is the one that you're flying now. So you don't want, you want to make sure there's no damage whatsoever after the ultimate loading. And so that's where the analysis can help to provide the extra confidence, but it may not be sufficient. So that's why you wanna pay attention to these factors very carefully. Again, first two columns for testing, the next two columns are for analysis, the structural margins with your A basis, for, with your uh, highest loading condition that your flight article is gonna experience. Uh, the third one is for very few, like if you have only few to fly, you could then do a proof test of all the articles, all of them, make sure, and the ultimate is 1.1. Here the ultimate is higher because you're protecting against proof test failures in the long run. That's what it is higher. But here is lower because I don't mind if I, I fail one since I'm only flying a few. So that's okay, 1.1 proof factor, ultimate 1.1. And again, the yield 1.1, but again, using the higher factors for ultimate to protect against failures. And here, you're really making sure that this article that's been flown that is properly string gauged so you can validate your models. 
There's also the option of not testing at all. And usually those are reserved for secondary structures. They're not carrying the primary load. Uh, and so therefore um, you wanna use a yield factor of 1.6 and an ultimate factor of 2.0. Um, and again, this is usually done uh, for secondary structures. Then you have qualification by similarity um, and qualification, and this no test also, by the way, usually apply to metallic structures alone. Qualification based on similarity, uh, that's a situation where you have a previous structure, say, structure A, and that structure, you evolved it just a little bit. So now it becomes structure B. Structure B is the one you're flying, but structure A is an older version of that. The thing here is that you could, instead of doing a full qualification testing again, if you're able to show that structure B is better than structure A, from the structural margin perspective, the fatal moles are the same. So the one you're flying structure B, structure A is that one you qualified before, maybe 10 years ago. If you can show that analysis bounds structure B, you can show the fatal moles are the same. You can show that the manufacturing process is basically the same, that the training is the same, that the materials are the same, that the geometry is, you know, almost the same, then you can just do the analysis and, and be confident you'll be okay. Uh, and, but again, you have to make sure your fatal moles are okay. And so when you change the design, it's important to make sure that the fatal mode did not shift to something you did not expect. And so that's why it's important that, that structure A and structure B be, be very similar. Uh, and, and also, uh, the, the, you can stretch what this means also, qualification based on similarity. Uh, I, I won't go through that here, but the important thing here to mention is that there is criteria that can be used that are outlined in various standards that, that provide that criteria. But you wanna make sure you evaluate things very carefully if you select the bottom option. You also have pressure vessel requirements. So metallic pressure vessels need to be cycled four times the maximum expected operating pressure. You also have to burst test the, the, the metallic pressure vessel to a 1.5 times the, the, the MEOP. Um, and here the burst factor is 1.5. Uh, you also need to do a special extra verification. It needs to pass random vibrations, thermal vacuum, thermal cycle test may be required. You wanna make sure that leak before burst, that these metallic pressure vessels are strong enough for a leak before burst scenario. And so that needs to demonstrate that through crack does not lead to rupture. So say that this wall gets breached, you don't want that to blow up apart. I'd rather have a leak before I have a big catastrophic event. And so that's what that one is about. Damage tolerance or safe life here is really talking about if I have a flaw at the NDI limit, at the non-destructive evaluation limit, that that flaw does not propagate to failure catastrophically. Um, and if there's any leakage, you don't wanna lose mission performance. So really comes down to demonstrating a flaw smarter than NDI is, 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 is adequate. Uh, and the factor that's typically used in these kinds of analyses is 4X. So if I show that a particular flaw so can survive, this vessel can survive a thousand cycles, then you can probably accept it to only 200, a fourth of a thousand cycles. So 250 cycles. Uh, composite override pressure vessels, again, I have a second part of this course that goes into that. The four time service lives there as well. Uh, the design factor is 1.5, and the burst strength after impact pressure test um, needs to be demonstrated. So if you have some sort of impact damage event, you want to make sure that the composite override pressure vessel can survive that. Now, there's a large set of requirements outlined in SO81B that I won't go through in this lecture. It's covering a second portion of this class. Uh, but Bottom line is there are component unit level qualification that need to be met uh, for these kinds of structures. Pressure components, uh, these are components that are largely driven by pressure. Examples of that would be a valve, say. A valve, a bellows, a, 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 a pipe, for example, uh, piping. 
tubes, lines, fittings, those tend to be uh, very, it tends to be very hard to do a safe life assessment or damage tolerance assessment. And for that reason, higher factors of safety are used typically. A proof factor typically a minimum 1.5. So if the pressure is 1,000 PSI, you proof test those lines and fittings to uh, 1.5 times that. The burst factor also is higher, uh, and those burst factors uh, are really intended to, to, to make sure that the stresses in the part are fairly low, and the proof factor is fairly high to screen for any small flaws, and together that, uh, they give you confidence that your design and the operation of your flight article will be successful. So again, these are the factors that are typically used, uh, and um, yeah, so that's how you'll go about that. Test versus no test. Uh, structural designs generally require uh, verification by analysis. Um, and so, you know, so typically a no test approach um, involves just doing analysis alone. And so those are usually reserved for metallic structures. And usually you want to approach that for secondary structures only. Um, usually if you do a null test, the NASA or whoever's uh, in charge will have to prove for that. Um, there are programs that could use a higher null test factor depending upon the type of hardware. Uh, increasing the design factors of safety does not by itself justify null test factor. Uh, some examples of criteria on which to base such an approach are as follows. The structural design the structural design is simple uh, with easily determined load paths. The design has been thoroughly analyzed for all critical load conditions. The structure is similar in overall configuration, design detail, build quality, and critical load conditions to a previous structure that was successfully tested with a good correlation of test results to analytical predictions for which the same level of process controls was maintained. You can also have the situation where um, the analyses to test correlations have been quite demonstrated. You have demonstrated analyses uh, really well. You know, it's a good tool. It correlates against test data. So again, every program uh, is going to have different criteria. You have to look at the criteria for that program um, before you jump to a conclusion of what needs to be done. The qualification factors of safety for NASA uh, are driven by 5001. You can find them. Uh, again, 1.4 factor safety, larger than for unmanned vehicles. Uh, a yield factor 1.0, you want to make sure that you prevent detrimental, detrimental yielding, meaning any plasticity or anything like that is not going to demo, impact the functional performance of the part or cause excessive deformations that could be a problem or could be initiation for fatigue. A qualification test factor is 1.4, so this goes into your test, this one goes into your analysis. And then the proof test factor there is lower than what you saw in the AIAA. But again, these are their requirements, 1.05, the NASA requirements, 1.05. And uh, then you could have the proto flight. Uh, again, uh, here, this could be the one that you actually fly. Uh, this one is the one you're not flying. So prototype, you're not flying. Proto flight, you are flying. So here, again, the factor is higher, but the qualification test factor is lower. And you can see here the yield is kept to a higher value as well. And then you have the minimum design and test factors for, com for composites and bonded joints. Uh, here you can see that uh, if you have composites, this is for metallics, the, the table on the top. The table at the bottom is composites. You can see here they're looking for higher factors in general where you have discontinuity, uh, 1.4 in general for the ultimate factor, 1.24 if you fly that article. But again, the ultimate design factor in this column is generally higher uh, and, and it's intended to protect uh, damage from uh, the hardware from damage. Proof test factors are also fairly large, 1.2 if you're gonna fly that particular article, 1.05 if you're not flying it. And again, the, the design factor is protecting you, hopefully for uh, if you're flying that unit, it's protecting against any damage that may have occurred uh, well, you, you're protecting the harbor from damage, bottom line. That's why this factor is higher for the margin safety calculation. 
for ceramic and glass, the analysis factors are higher. You also have to do a proof test. Uh, and also for glass and ceramics, again, design factors are higher, proof test factors relatively lower. So that covers uh, some of these uh, requirements here. Let's go through the NASA JSC 65828. You can download it online and look at it on your own. And these are the structural design requirements and factors of safety for spaceflight hardware, for human spaceflight specifically. And so this version is 2014. There's always, you always want to look at to see if there's a new version coming out. Uh, but it typically a standard is going to provide you the purpose, how, the applicability of that document. Uh, for example, here it says the requirements specifically excluded from the standards are materials and processes, design loads determination, fresh control, glass fasteners, liquid propulsion engines greater than 6,000 pounds in thrust. For example, NASA has fracture requirements that are documented in, in NASA 1519 and NASA 5009. And the version can vary depending upon when it was released. And so again, uh, here is telling you very specifically what the purpose of the requirements are and, and what is being um, intended here. And then it also talks about how to implement it the tailoring approaches and constraints and preconditions to this uh, particular um, NASA uh, standard. Uh, so for example, design consideration should include material property degradation under the service environments. Material allowable should be chosen to minimize the probability of structural failure due to material variability. And allowable should be based on sufficient material tests to establish values on statistical basis. So that's an example of that. The documents uh, is going to give you a list of applicable documents. Here it tells you SO80 is an applicable document. SO81A is an applicable document, as an example. And it'll give you, for example, here's two standards uh, that it's asking you to look at to make sure that your system uh, can actually meet those requirements. 1519, the fracture control requirements. Now there are several versions. Now it's 1519A. And for the engines is asking you to look at 5012, which is 5012B now. Uh, so again, uh, there's a number of standards and you have to look at for your particular program, what, what, is, what is the standards for that program and what do I need to meet? Then you have the reference documents that are also provided here at the bottom. I cover some aspects of S110. Here's the MMPDS for which you guys, uh, you have looked at uh, for, as part of the assignments. And then here you have other standards as well, like for bellows here, it's providing that one for bellows uh, and for flow induced vibration for bellows, which I covered in the second portion of this course. You also have uh, requirements, for example, here it talks about composite mill handbook 17 and these three handbooks that are now fairly used. They can be very useful in the design of, of, of composite materials. So if you wanna come up with the A basis allowable, for example, these standards will explain how to do that. We kind of did that in this course, but it provides you that. NASA SP8007 is a buckling standard, uh, not, not standard, but a guidance on how to go about that. NASA STD 5018 provides a strength and design verification criteria for glass, ceramics, and windows in human space applications. 5020 provides the uh, standard for fasteners. Uh, and I want to point out, you know, I, I also cover that in the second portion of this course. NASA 6016 provides the process requirements for materials. And then you can go on and on and on here. This is for bellows here, 08123 for flow induced vibration. And then you have a parachute uh, recovery systems design manual. And then again, SMC SO5 um, is, is for pressurized systems. And uh, then you have uh, the order of precedence is explains, you know, what should go first. Um, and then you have the structural requirements. This is where you get into the beef of that. All this is telling you is to be very good at documentation. And I'll let you pause the video, read this on your own if you want to. Uh, pause the video here now if you want to. But this, again, we talked about PDR, we talked about CDR. You should have a good understanding now how everything starts to fit together. 
Um, here, um, it tells you things such as uh, the proposed method for dynamic math model, verification of the primary and significant secondary structural hardware as defined in this particular document. Uh, you need to provide rationale if no dynamic testing is planned, as an example. So this providing a lot of information, you have to go through that. The stress analysis, the design stress analysis reports need to be looked at. You also have uh, the structural test plans been discussed. Uh, you want to have, make sure you have a good test plan that proposes the load conditions, the structural configuration to be tested, the method of test, including how you apply the loads and instrumentation. And then you want to provide and, and prepare and submit it to the NASA technical authority for them to review that. Structural test reports as well have to show now the, the, the information about structural margins and stuff like that. So the test report has to provide models, the stresses, the forces uh, developed during the test. And you also have to show the test configuration, the analysis of the test configuration and demonstrating that the test objectives were met. So very comprehensive reports need to be generated. In part two here is really telling you what are the requirements for the design verification. So that's structural design here, part two here. And so it goes through that and, and each requirement is numbered uniquely. So here you have STR0003, here you have STR0005. And, and usually you're gonna have a single shawl statement that you have to meet. All he's saying here is make sure your margin safety is greater than zero uh, for the ultimate strength condition. And then they provide you information about the rationale, uh, you know, the rationale for why they're asking you to do that. Um, the limit loads, we talked about limit loads already, those need to be multiplied by the ultimate factors of safety, and they're sometimes called the ultimate loads. Uh, you also want to account for any degradation of material properties. We already covered that, and that's usually accounted for in the E basis allowable. The factors of safety requirements, we'll cover that a little bit later in this document. And then here it talks about detrimental deformation. The fly hardware sh shall not have detrimental deformation when you apply limit loads multiplied by the yield factors of safety. So you want to make sure that detrimental deformation does not occur. And it could occur uh, due to a number of different issues. Uh, it could cause unintentional contact, misalignment, or divergence between adjacent components. It could cause significant internal load redistribution in a structure that's not intended. It can cause the component to exceed the dynamic space envelope. It can cause reductions in strength uh, be below a particular level. So that's fatigue, for example. It can degrade the effectiveness of thermal protection system. It can degrade aerodynamic functional characteristics of the vehicle. Um, and it can induce leakage above specified rates. So very important to make sure you have no detrimental deformation in these kinds of structures. When exposed to, for example, accept acceptance or proof test loading conditions. Yielding during ground transportation uh, shall, shall not yield during ground loading. Uh, because that's, you already started uh, in the bad footing there. Yield margin of safety, again, uh, you want to ensure you have positive margin of safety for the yield factors of safety, accounting for a number of uh, things here. Pause the video again and check it out. It also tells you that the design of thin wall structures should be uh, subject uh, to buckling load conditions through a service life that accounts for the differences between the model geometry and the physical structure. And SP8007 here provides knockdown factors that account for the differences between analysis predictions and test predictions. So these buckling calculations should account for these buckling knockdown factors. Again, I covered this in the second portion of this course. Structural members need to be subject to instability. And so you don't want the structure to collapse due to buckling at limit loads specifically, multiply by the ultimate factors of safety and ensuring that these ultimate factors are not applied to the loading conditions that uh, do not cause buckling. So pressure does not cause buckling, so you should not be applying that factor to, the, to that one, for example. 
So I'll continue then with a discussion of deformation due to buckling. Uh, flat hardware shall not deform in any manner that degrades the function of the structure or produces on account uh, for changes in loading uh, or produces on account, on account for changes in loading due to buckling when limit loads are applied unless the structure was designed to crush during the load event. In other words, you don't want the structure to deform in a manner that will degrade the function of that structure. So that's why you want to pay attention to that one. It also tells you how to treat fatigue. So if you have uh, cyclic fatigue loading, it tells you that it has to have a minimum fatigue life of four point times the service life. And it should preclude failure resulting from cumulative damage. Uh, so that's very important. High cycle fatigue, we're looking at a factor of 10 for that. Uh, because low cycle fatigue versus high cycle fatigue, that can uh, produ produce quite a bit of differences in behavior. Uh, high cycle fatigue has more scatter in the data than low cycle fatigue. Creep, uh, you also have to make sure that the structure can survive creep conditions. And then creep life here is taken as four, and then in other standards, they can be taken up to 10. And what is creep again? So if you have a loading and the loading is sustained, you want to make sure that the structure does not exhibit creep to that number. And then you have uh, requirements for the factors of safety for metallic flight structure, for non-metallic flight structures. And then it goes into more detail about composites. And it tells you that you have to verify this design through testing that come for the worst case environmental conditions during the service life. Also talks to you about design and analysis best practices. So the designer and manufacturer has to use the manufacturing processes controls for the coupon testing, sampling techniques, building block approach. And, and you need to make sure that you're applying consistent practices to that particular flight unit. So that's that one. And then you want to make sure you have a good plan to protect the hardware from impact damage. And we cover that quite a bit as well. Uh, you also have a powerful systems requirements. You have structural soft goods and pressurized hardware uh, requirements. So, so here, the, and more specifically, the pressurized hardware requirements go into several things. It talks about pressure controls and making sure that you have pressure regulators, relief devices, and thermal control system that collectively provide a two-fault tolerant uh, from causing the pressure to exceed the maximum pressure. Uh, and so here it gives you the rationale for that. And that was used quite a bit uh, in the heritage for the shuttle and the Inter International Space Station to define the maximum pressure. Uh, and then it tells you that in the case uh, where MDP is not defined or the maximum design pressure is not defined because of the two fault tolerant pressure control, then a maximum operating pressure has to be defined uh, and then NASA will have to approve it. Uh, here, SMCS05 provides guidance for performing a system functional analysis uh, to make sure there is not an unsafe condition that results. Then you have these re relief devices this talked about. Um, it talks about metallic pressure hardware. Uh, and it tells you it needs to comply with SO80, the AIAA SO80. Uh, so that, that it defers it to another standard, and that's fairly typical. Um, but it tells you that you have to use a different factors of safety, uh, which are defined in this section. So if I click here, it goes to those. Uh, so, you know, just showing you the example of how that works. Uh, as an example. <clears throat> and then you have applicable design pressures to be used in place of those in the AIAA standard uh, here. Uh, and then you have composite overwrap pressure vessels being discussed. And it, again, defers you to another standard, but it provides some modifications within this standard for composite overwrap pressure vessels. And they tailor it for human space flight. They may not feel that the AWA is fully sufficient. So then NASA could then tailor those standards to their needs and then require that their, their contractors meet those requirements for space flight. Pressure stabilized structure um, also been talked about here. 
uh, the pressure established structure has to maintain the minimum required internal pressure to withstand limit loads multiplied by the appropriate ultimate factor of safety. You also have doors and hatches, flow induced vibrations, and it defers you to another one to look at for that. Uh, restraints for flexible hoses. Secondary volumes uh, are being discussed. And uh, here uh, they ask you how to deal with that. These are compartments or volumes that are integral or attached by design to pressurized system components. And what they're asking is to apply a 1.5 minimum factor of safety uh, for this kind of components. Liquid proportion hardware is deferring now to 5012, which is a standard that covers engines, liquid rocket engines. 5012B now is the latest version. You can take a look. Uh, and then for engines that have less than 6,000 pounds of thrust, that provide you a set of requirements that are unique to those. Uh, Star rocket motors, again, they're pointing you to factor safety requirements contained in this section and the applicable design pressures to be used in place of those defined on, on, on the AIAA standards are defined in this section. So if you go and click here, uh, you again get, get to, well, you didn't go to the right section, but I'll show you later that that's where it will go. And uh, again, solid rocket motors use MUP without any special approval. Rotating machinery like uh, motors, gyroscope, flywheels, transmissions, and so forth uh, have to meet the requirements specified in the letter section, they tell you. Um, and then they talk about design loads for rotary, rotary machinery, uh, rotodynamics. So here saying the critical speed shall not be of the type of a frequency response that will be deteriorous to the safety and operation of rotary machinery. In other words, you don't want the critical speeds to, to, to enter into resonance with a system frequency. We cover this more in the uh, part two of this, uh, of this uh, course. Also provide strength requirements for rotary machinery, for wire, ropes, and cables, fasteners, and fastening joints. That's covered in NASA 5020. Again, covering part, portion part two of this course. Seals, as an example, need to be looked at. And you have a critical seal redundancy. Uh, been talked about here, um, and then you have factors of safety. Here, factors of safety are provided uh, for the designs. And here it says that the, the factor of safety has to be applied. I covered this before, but I want to emphasize this again. The factor of safety is applied to all the loads, mechanical and thermal stresses. And so that, why? Because thermal stresses and loads are derived from thermal models. Are, they're often uncertain and un unverified. And, and in, in fact, the stresses also have dispersion because the modulus disperses. Metallic structures uh, need to be designed to the minimum factor. So safety, and I'll show you those factors in a second. Um, and it tells you more about untested factors of safety like I covered before, and explains to you when untested factors of safety could be used. Here's a minimum factor of safety for metallic fly structures. I already went through this one. Uh, the beryllium, beryllium, beryllium structures, here's a factor for those. And it tells you the minimum buckling margin of safety for those is 10%. And they give it special consideration to beryllium structures because they're brittle and they're sensitive, sensitive to flaws. And yeah, so that's why you wanna pay attention to these structures. Non-metallic structures, uh, we already covered uh, for composites in general, what kinds of factors to be using. And structural soft goods, here's an example of structural soft goods, uh, factors that they, they're proposing. Um, and what I mean with structural soft goods, uh, they're going to be things like parachute, parafoils, um, sorry, I, I meant straps, fabrics, inflatable structures, gossamer structures, and other soft goods is what I meant. And then the parachute and powerful systems will have <coughs> another set of requirements. And you can see here, ultimate loads provided here. And they will defer uh, the methods to, to fabrics uh, into this standard and to this standard. 
Pressure hardware, uh, again, they're providing a very comprehensive list of, uh, of, of basically of factors that need to be used. Uh, here for lines and fittings, you can see one and a half and 4.0. Uh, and then for lines and fittings with 1.5 inch outside diameter greater 1.5 and 2.5, these are your margins you need to be calculated to this. And then you have combined loading condition. They're saying to use a 1.4 for the combined load and to, for yielding, they're not giving you a factor of safety. That's not in, congruent with other standards. But again, every standard is different. Every organization is different. Uh, here you have uh, systems such as valves, cylinders, regulators, heat pipes. Here they're looking at one and a half and two and a half. And when there's combined loads other than pressure, 1.4. Metallic pressure vessels also looked at here. We covered some of these factors before. Composite override pressure vessels, 1.25 for proof, but the burst factor to 2.0. And if you have combined loads, 1.4 for that. Doors hatches, uh, 1.5 for that. Uh, and uh, flex hoses like bellows and other things like that. Proof pressure 2.0, burst pressure 4.0. And combined loading condition 1.4. And it continues here with solid rocket motor uh, case, where well, this is pressurized structures, I apologize. Pressurized structures, um, if not solid rocket motor cases or specified below, then that'll be proof pressure 1.1, ultimate pressure 1.4, and then if you have a combined load condition 1.4. Metallic propellant tanks that are pressurized structures, here they're saying proof pressure 1.05, but the combined loading condition 1.4 and no yielding at 1.1. Composite pressure tanks, uh, there are pressurized structures. Uh, those go through this set of requirements here. You can pause the video and kind of study that. Liquid rocket engines, again, uh, you wanna follow this standard here, this requirement here. Uh, and they need to be specified against table one of 5012. Solar rocket motor are designed to these factors now, 1.1 uh, and 1.4. Uh, composite solid rocket motor cases that are pressurized structures are designed to 1.5 ultimate combined loading condition. The proof pressure is 1.2 and the propellants, insulation, liner, and inhib inhibitors, those are designed to a factor of two. Rotating machinery needs to be looked at. Uh, here they tell you that any rot rot rotating machinery, you need to do a spin test factor um, and that, that's given here and then the qual spin factor of this much. Wire ropes and cables, uh, 4.0, and then the proof factor, 2.0. Fasteners and fastening joints, again, following NASA 5020. And then here it tells you how to combine loads for various situations. For ultimate loads, uh, you want to include pressure, mechanical, and thermal. That's basically across the board for all of them. Very specifically telling you how to do that how to combine mechanical stress loads, how to combine with thermal loads, uh, how to combine with pressure loads. And you, you can only combine it like that if any of the stress component is relieving. So if the component is stress relieving, you don't apply a factor on that. You only apply it to those that harm you. Uh, so that's how you will do that. Uh, and so again, uh, fatigue life factors, we talked about that. Uh, they recommend a 1.15 additional factor on stress. And these are intended to provide margin to account for material fatigue curves scatter, data scatter. Um, and so that, that's what that's recommended. Creep life factor, we covered that 1.15 on top of the stress or strain. And then you have the bearing uh, factor for joints uh, as well that needs to be looked at. Then you have a number of requirements uh, targeting structural loads and environments, uh, red, redistribution of loads, loads due to friction, uh, loads due to collapse, uh, external pressure or torsional loads, internal pressure loads. Uh, then it goes into math verification. And they want, they want the models to be verified uh, against the test. That's basically what it is telling you. Um, and they're asking you to make sure that the models are sufficient accuracy uh, in the design development and structural test integrity assessments. 
So pause the video and kind of read this through or download the document on your own and read at your own leisure. The model verification test input should apply the appropriate test factors and that is going to depend upon whether it's low test, test option one, test option two. I already kind of went through that. So I don't want to cover the design factors again. Uh, you want to make sure that the tests are adequately matched. The, the, the analysis matched the test and they're asking for 10% within 10% uh, if you can. Uh, they also want rationale. Uh, the inability to inadequately correlate model prediction with test data can be a problem uh, because those are the ones you're using to, fa to basically come up with a test program and also to verify the design. And then it goes into structural materials. So that's how this standard reads in general. So that's how most standards read. It doesn't mean that they're the same everywhere. And I don't want you to take this standard as the end of everything. Every program is gonna have its own requirement. You have to just meet those requirements in the design process. And if you don't meet those requirements, you may have to work with the overseeing agency or the customer to, to kind of figure out what you can work on to tailor the standards to meet what they're looking for. 